morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this Palm Sunday worship service at John McMillan Presbyterian Church. I'm Samantha Coggins. I am an associate pastor here, and our senior pastor is Reverend Jeff Tyndall, who will be preaching today. It's good to have you with us, whether you're worshiping with us via live stream or uh, via video later on in the day or week or here in person in our sanctuary. I have a couple of announcements to commend to your attention this morning. One is our Holy Week schedule. This is the week that starts today and ends with Easter. There are a couple of services that I will commend to your attention. Our Maundy Thursday service is this Thursday, April 6th, here in the sanctuary at 7.30 p.m. And our Good Friday service is this Friday, April 7th, at 12 p.m. in the afternoon. On Easter Sunday, there will be a sunrise service, in person only, at 7 a.m. And then we will have our Easter worship service here in the sanctuary at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday, April 9th. All of those services will be streamed on Facebook Live, with the exception of the sunrise service, which will only be in person for early risers. <laughs> and last, if you are interested in having a frozen quiche on hand for Easter Sunday, please see Judy Godelli about that. They are available for $18 each. With that, I invite you now to prepare to worship God. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our call to worship this morning. With crowds from ancient times, we cry, Hosanna, save us. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you in the house of the Lord.
be seated. Siblings in Christ, on this Sunday when we shout Hosanna, pray God save us, Christ comes to the center of our busy, conflicted lives in triumph and humility, in glory and in mercy. Christ comes knowing the best of who we are and the worst of who we are. So now, trusting in God's grace, let us make our confessions, joining our voices together for our prayer of confession, found in your bulletin and on the screen. Christ, our Redeemer, try as we might. We do not follow your example. We do not empty ourselves. We do not humble ourselves. We are not obedient. You simply ask us to care about this world you created, but we fail to do even that. Forgive us. You have given us the greatest, clearest example of love. Heal us and help us to follow. Friends in Christ, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. God does not count our sins against us, but offers us a free gift of righteousness. Thanks be to God. be seated. I invite you now into a posture of prayer. God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, in Jesus, you come to us humbly, riding a donkey and proclaiming a message of peace. We pray this morning, God, for our church, for earth and all its creatures, and for all people in need, saying, God of mercy, hear our prayer. This morning we pray especially for those in our church, our own congregation. We pray for the family of Walter and Marjorie Till, for Doug and his siblings, for their spouses, for Walt and Marge's grandchildren, as they mourn the recent death of Marjorie and the death of Walter this past Monday. God, be an ever-present hand of comfort in their lives. For those grieving and sick among us, God, those whose trials we might not even know about, who are limping toward Easter, in body, mind, or spirit, or all three. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray that Christians here and abroad hear and share the word of God as true disciples. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray especially on this Palm Sunday, God, that all ends of the earth would receive the words of Jesus, the King of Peace. We pray especially for those in Nashville, Tennessee this week and for our aching, grieving nation as we process that six people, three children and three adults, were killed last week at a school. 
Like the people lining the streets of Jerusalem in the Bible, we shout, Hosanna, pray, save us, God. Turn our swords into plowshares. Search our hearts and know them. Make us instruments of your peace. Let us remember the holy math that you do, forgiving our sins, not counting them against us. And let the only equation we know be your infinite love. Imprinted on our hearts, above the din of the news cycles that desensitize us to other people's pain. Move us toward a society, God, where the lists of children's names who have died in school are empty, like the very tomb Jesus rose from. Move us to assure our children and youth that their safety and worth is beyond measure. Move us and our leaders to act this out in all that we say and do. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that all leaders of church and state prefer humble service to empty power. God of mercy, hear our prayer. That all people live with gratitude for the gifts of nourishment, friendship, family, trust, patience, and hope, with the courage and wisdom to change whatever fails to be life-giving, and the courage and wisdom to know when things cannot be changed. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that those who see the cross starkly revealed in their lives <clears throat> draw strength from the name that is above every other name at which every knee shall bow, Jesus Christ. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that we might live with gratitude for our ancestors, whose faith and witness have nourished our own, that all who mourn today will be comforted, and that we who hope to greet Jesus when Christ comes again will be ready and filled with joy. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Show your children the way to freedom through the gentle obedience of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we have gathered here together to commemorate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem. A triumphal entry that began something that has changed the world and continues to change it day by day. And we know that one of the ways it changes the world is your presence among us as we worship you and as we live our lives in accordance with your way. And so we ask now that you touch our hearts and our minds so that we can hear the word the way you would have it heard, so that we can understand the word the way you would have it understood, and so we can live the word the way you would have it lived. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So most of you know that I am a big history buff. I like reading American history in particular. And sometimes the books I read are extraordinarily long, but still interesting. And as I was preparing the message for today, I'm reading, or listening to, I should say, a book by Doris Kearns Goodwin called The Bully Pulpit. It's a story about the growth of the relationship between Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, and also the dissolution of that relationship in 1912. Which reminded me, when I was reading these stories about particularly the Republican convention in 2012, and then shortly thereafter, something called the Bull Moose Convention of 2012, I was reminded that when I was a kid, I actually enjoyed watching the conventions, both of them, the Republican National Convention and the Democrat National Convention. I have no idea why I thought they were so much fun to watch, but it might be because there were only three channels on the television, and they were on all of the channels. But I still thought they were really pretty cool. Not so much because of the speeches, because I was just a little kid and I didn't really understand what they were talking about. But I was a kid and I liked the chaos. All the weird campaign apparel, you know, those big tall hats. All the campaign buttons, the big ones, you know, that had the name of their favorite candidate on them. All the signs that they held up and waved around. And then there were these things called demonstrations. Now, I'm not talking about protest marches. I'm talking about timed, planned, scheduled demonstrations that were basically there to entertain the crowd between the speeches. Then came the nomination. Rarely was there more than one person nominated because typically by the time the convention rolled around, there was, the nominee had already been decided. But then there was the vote which was, I, th I thought was particularly cool, because they would go through it state by state, alphabetical order, and I would wait with bated breath, and wait, and wait, and wait, and then Pennsylvania! And every year it was the same thing. Their vote was announced this way. The great Commonwealth, the great Keystone State, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, proudly casts all of its votes for the next President of the United States. And that speech would be recited at both the Republican and Democrat conventions, because in both conventions, they were really hoping that's what they were doing, <coughs> nominating the next President of the United States. And then when the voting was concluded, out would come the nominee, and there would be pandemonium. Even the people that didn't like him very much, and it was always a him in those days. Even they would be standing on their chairs, whooping it up for the person who was going to save the country from that evil other party. Standing ovation. And then there would be a speech, and it would take forever, even if it was a short speech, like one of my sermons. <laughs> because unlike my sermons, people would stand up and cheer throughout the whole thing. <laughs> You go, Jeff, go. No, that never happens here. <laughs> and after the speech was over, to thunderous applause, there would be balloons and confetti falling from the ceiling. And the entire convention erupted into some sort of mania. 
for their candidate hailed to be the next president of the United States. And this all happened at both conventions because, as I said, they both indeed thought that's what they were doing, hailing the coming of the next president. And then, and then came the long slog to November. All that gaiety, all that celebration <laughs> as the campaign started. And there was no more, we've got the best guy. It was always, they've got the worst guy. It was really brutal. The campaigns were seeking to assure success to their candidate by tearing down the other candidate. It was, it was really brutal. And one wonders, when you watch these campaigns, why anyone would want to run for the office. Their lives get torn apart, their privacy completely ripped away. But happily, I think, each of the candidates had a good reason to run for the presidency. Hopefully, those uh, reasons were patriotic. Hopefully, they were a fervor for justice. Reasons that are important, so important that the brutality of the campaign was somehow worth it. So what does this have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, we have two texts today. One is Matthew's news-like account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem with praise and palms. That's why we call it Palm Sunday, although some people call it Passion Sunday, because it begins Jesus' final walk to the cross, which is why our second reading comes from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah describes what it is like to bear that banner, to bear the banner of one who speaks truth to power and how it can be endured. So let's get to our scripture readings. Our first one comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Listen to and hear this familiar passage. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. The Lord has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. So let's set the stage. What's going on in Jerusalem when Jesus comes in on the triumphal entry? Well, it's Passover. This is not a good time for Jews to make a fuss. Pilate knows about Passover. He knows what it means. It is about a rebellion against the Egyptian pharaoh and ultimately the escape of the uh, enslaved uh, Jews into the promised land. And so he will put up with none of that. They are celebrating the freedom from slavery in Egypt, the beginning of the Exodus, not the kind of celebration that Pilate wants. And this could always turn out to be an attempt at revolt, which always gets back to the emperor's ear and makes Pilate, Pilate's position difficult. So if you're a Pontius Pilate, the appointed government governor of these troublesome Jews, you are thinking this would be a prime opportunity for them to protest the current enslavement, to think that they could somehow cast off the Roman slavery. And you can't have that if you're Pilate. And so one way to squelch such an activity would be a nice show of Roman power, which is typically what Pilate did in those days, every year during the Passover. He would travel from Caesarea, where his palace was, to Jerusalem, and he would enter the city in grand splendor. Like the legions of the old Romans, he would ride a white stallion, followed by his adoring court. He would then parade through the streets of Jerusalem so his entrance could not go unnoticed, and the message would be clear. Challenge the status quo at your peril. No dissent will be tolerated. Rome is in charge here. And don't think that's ever going to change. And then, Jesus rides into town. Riding into Jerusalem, he arrives as an opposition party, so to speak, to the Roman power. Rising up against the status quo, and his entrance certainly says that. He uses an image that he knew all the Jews of Jerusalem would understand. Jesus rides into Jerusalem looking like the king that is described by the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. There was no mistaking the message. So sure, Jesus is seemingly riding in humbly on a donkey rather than a white stallion, but that's how the prophet, the new king, was supposed to come. And so Jesus knew that prophecy, and so he knew what he was doing when he rode that donkey into Jerusalem. He seems to embody that and say, that's me. That's me. And he has supporters, lots of supporters followers who have been following him throughout the three years of his ministry around Judea. You see, remember, you have to remember that Jesus' ministry mostly took place in Galilee, which was some distance from Jerusalem. And so the people that were following him into Jerusalem were pretty much out of towners. They were coming to support him, to introduce him to the Jews in Jerusalem. And they are singing Jesus' praises, and they are making a statement, too. He is the one everyone has been waiting for. Now, Matthew reports no patriotic music. Matthew reports no inspirational uh, music that we get at the conventions when we see presidential nominees get their nomination. But he does report something quite like that. The people are saying, Hosanna in the highest heaven. The one has come to save us. And they cry out the words of Psalm 118, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Over and over and over. They're making sure that the people know who this Jesus is. They don't have any confetti or balloons or fireworks, but what they do have are their cloaks. And so they take their cloaks off and they lay them on the ground so that the donkey doesn't touch the ground as it goes into Jerusalem. And then when they don't have a cloak, they find some palm branches and they throw those on the street for the same reason. This, this is their candidate for king. 
and there is immediate opposition. Competition for the allegiance of the people. Jesus and his followers versus the Romans and their followers, the temple authorities and the Sanhedrin, Herod and his court. And Jesus rides right into the middle of it, seemingly ready to take them all on. But he's not coming to Jerusalem to conduct a political campaign. He's coming to deliver a message. And he is coming to save the world. A message that called for some kind of demonstration, and Jesus does not disappoint. A demonstration of the power of God. Jesus has come to tell the people that those in power and those not, that they are, on, they are the only thing that really matters, and that they're invited into the kingdom of God altogether. And that kingdom is more powerful than any human institution. And Jesus will not be dismissed or ignored. He speaks truth to power of the temple authorities, of the power of Rome, of the power of Herod, regardless of the consequences. And there are certainly consequences, and he knows there are going to be consequences. Because when it soon becomes clear that Jesus is not waging a political campaign or a revolution against Rome, the praises of those who followed him stop. Palms are gone. Cloaks are gone. Now comes the passion. And the opposition moves in. The religious folks start a plot. Herod is not about to do anything that will put his fake kingship at risk. Pilate is, of course, ready to squash any trouble and Jesus knew all of this was coming because this is what happens when you speak truth to power. That's what Isaiah was talking about. Jesus knew Isaiah. He quoted Isaiah all the time. Isaiah was a prophet who was speaking for God. And prophets in the Old Testament never fared well. They were always people who wanted to shut them up, people who would whip them pull on their beards, insult and spit on them. Yet they could go on because they knew that God was with them. They knew it. They could go on because they knew God was with them and they would set their faces against the power like flint. And they knew that in the end they would be vindicated. And they were prepared for that. Some time ago, I listened to an interview of John Lewis. John Lewis was a close associate of Martin Luther King Jr. and ultimately became a member of Congress for many years. He just died a couple of years ago. Part of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and he was describing exactly how they prepared for their protest marches. He said that before someone was allowed to participate in one of these protest marches, they had to go through training. They had to be prepared. They had to know what was coming and recognize that they had to be willing to do it. This is what Lewis said. Before we even discussed the possibility of a sit-in, we had role-playing. And we went through the motion of someone harassing you, pulling you out of your seat, pulling your chair from under you, someone kicking you or pretending to spit on you. Sometimes we did pour cold water on someone, but we went through the motion. This was drama because we wanted to feel like they were in an actual situation, that this could happen. So when the time came, we were ready. We were prepared. When we left to go on the Freedom Ride, we were prepared to die for what we believed in. Prepared to die? Well, some of them did. A lot of them did. Because that so often happens when you speak truth to power. The thought is, from the powerful side, is that if you eliminate the speaker, the protest somehow goes away. And often it does. Kill the speaker and the movement will die. 
Jesus knew that that's what Pilate was going to be thinking about. He knew that that's what Herod was going to be thinking about. He knew that that's what the people in the Sanhedrin were going to be thinking about. And he was prepared. He was prepared because he knew Isaiah. He knew the prophets. He knew what he was up against. He knew what was coming. And he was not going to concede to the power of human institutions. He would rather die. And he knew that he would. It's all part of the plan that Jesus had before he rode into Jerusalem. It was going to be a, a spectacular entrance. Lots of palms, lots of cloaks. It was going to be beautiful. Followed by a humiliating rejection and a brutal death. That was horrible. Horrible. Terrible. But then, but then, Jesus knew what was going to happen next. The Lord God would help him. He would not be disgraced. He would not be put to shame. He would be vindicated. He challenged his opponents to stand up to him and confront him, and he knew that the Lord God was going to uphold him, even throughout this terrible week. That is how Jesus could endure what was going to happen in what we call the Passion. There would be, in the end, a spectacular reappearance. And because of that, we know the truth. We know where the power really is, which is why we celebrate Palm and Passion Sunday. It was the beginning, and it continues today. Jesus and his followers speaking truth to power, even at the cost of their lives, entering into the kingdom of God, calling out those who would lift up power over justice, contending with those who would lift up wealth over generosity, denouncing those who lift up hate over love, proclaiming a better way, the Jesus way. It's a hard road sometimes, both beautiful and terrible. But there's a promise at the end, and we're going to talk about that next week. Amen. Happy days are here again. Jeff's done preaching. <laughs>
Our affirmation of faith today is the 23rd Psalm, and I want you to think about this. This is the one that encourages us to get from here to the kingdom of God, even during those dark times. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. Siblings in Christ, Jesus says, where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. At this time in our worship, I invite you to offer your lives to the Lord in the form of tithes and monetary gifts. We will now take up this morning's tithe, tithes and offerings. Hunger is defined as a condition in which a person does not have the physical or financial capability to meet basic nutritional needs for a sustained period. It can be brought on by disasters, poverty, or fleeing conflict. The experience of hunger to those who are hungry goes deeper. Food sustains life. Responding to hunger is an affirmation of life. One great hour of sharing is responding to hunger issues no matter the cause, both locally and globally. With programs to address the root causes of food insecurity and bring real and sustainable change by working together, side by side, one community at a time, all around the world. And with your support, we will not grow weary. We will indeed harvest a good crop. The need has never been greater. The opportunity is now. It's time to share.
God of grace, you have given us life in Christ. Today we bring the gifts of our work and of our hearts. May all that we bring and all that we are, our time, treasure, talents, be your means of grace in the world, that your people may encounter the good news. Amen. So as we come to the end of the service today, I invite you all to stay for a few minutes after the worship service to see something that I saw yesterday and thought was quite special. As you might know, we had our annual Easter egg hunt yesterday here at the church. We had, we had a lot of people, a lot of people. And one of the things that uh, our director of Christian education, Emily Shabilla, did was she created a video telling the Easter story. And it was cute and it was awesome, and it was well received, and I ask if you are willing to stay behind after the worship service and watch it as she does it again. So one of the things you're going to see in that video is the story of Holy Week. And Holy Week, we all know, begins with great anticipation, with the waving of palms. I didn't see anybody throwing their coats on the ground, but we did have waving palms. Um, and, but we also know that what happens next is not something we celebrate. We celebrate what comes next Sunday on Easter, but during this week we should contemplate the sacrifice that Jesus made, speaking truth to power on our behalf. And so while we do that, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We had a fantastic time celebrating Palm Sunday in the back today. I want to give a special shout out to our youth helpers who folded all of our palms into palm crosses and have sworn that they're never going to touch another palm again. Um, but if you'd like one, go ask them. <laughs> Maybe they'll help you fold it. So this is the video that we showed yesterday for the Easter egg hunt, and I just wanted to share it all with you and with some of our friends who weren't here yesterday. So excited. 
excited that you are here at the Easter egg hunt. I'm looking around and I see some of my friends from church. Over here I see some of my friends from preschool. And in the back I see some of my favorite parents. So thank you all for coming to our Easter egg hunt today. I want to share with you the Easter story. So I took this from the Beginner's Bible, which is the one that all the preschoolers get. And also, if you come to church here, you can get one. If you do not have one, let me know. I'd like to get you one. Okay, so, wait. Who else is here? Look, I'm here. I'm right there. I'm so happy to see you, me. I'm happy oh, to see you, too. Did you Easter eggs today? I did hide oh. Easter eggs yesterday. I know. But I do have Easter eggs, so mm -hmm. I also have some Easter eggs here. But these ones, what do you think's in them? Candy. No, it's not candy. Candy, candy. No, it's not candy. This is the Easter story told by eggs. So like I said, I took this from this Bible. If you would like one, let me know. The first one is the donkey. Here he is, little guy. And he goes with the palm branch. And this is how the story starts. Jesus and his disciples went to Jerusalem for a feast. Jesus told two disciples to bring him a donkey. Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, and a big crowd of people welcomed him. People waved palm branches, put them on the front of the road in front of Jesus. Some people shouted, Hosanna! Remember? And were happy to see Jesus. But the leaders in Jerusalem, they did not like Jesus. Not very nice. Boo! Boo! Yeah. <laughs> they did not want people to treat him like a king. So our next egg contains... Passover cup. So that's what this is. It kind of looks like the cup sometimes we have here on the communion table. Same thing. So this also goes along with bread, but I did not bring my bread today, so we have to pretend I'm eating some bread. Get your bread out. You what want kind do you bread? have? Raisin bread? Yeah, pretend you're eating some bread. <laughs> Mine's a king to Olive bread. So the Passover cup and bread. Jesus and his disciples went to the feast and picked up a loaf of bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces. He gave the bread to his disciples to eat. Jesus said, This bread is my body. Every time you do this, think of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine. Wine's my favorite. This is just juice, though. <laughs> just juice. And he gave it to the disciples to drink. He said, This is my blood. It pours out to forgive the sins of many. They all feasted together. Jesus knew that one of his disciples was going to turn Jesus into the leaders who did not like him. So they knew that something bad was going to happen soon. So the next one we have is some money. So this is three silver coins. The leaders gave one of Jesus' disciples three pieces of silver to tell them where Jesus was going. His name was Judas. So Judas said, I'll tell you where Jesus is if you give me some money. And they did. Also, not very nice. He should get a timeout. I know. He should get a timeout. I agree. The next egg we have are the praying hands. So it's very, very, very important that we pray to Jesus and we talk to God as much as we can. Right, friends? Right. These are the part of the story where Jesus went to his favorite garden to pray. When he was there, he was praying to God and telling God that he had all the faith of him, uh, in him in the world. He knew that God was going to take care of him. So the disciples went along with him to the garden to pray, and Judas came as well. Now remember, Judas was the not nice guy. Peter, Jesus' best friend, wanted to protect Jesus, but the soldiers arrested Jesus. So they said, Judas said, hey, Jesus is in the garden praying, and that's where they went and arrested him. Not nice. Not great. All right. Now, this is where our story starts to get a little bit sad, but I know that you guys can handle it. This is the cross of nails. They were very mean to Jesus, and they put him up on the cross, and he died. So we can take a minute to be sad. The other thing that they did, they took this. This is the crown of thorns, and they put it on his head. And everyone who loved Jesus was very sad. They were very sad, but they forgot something important. We knew that Jesus has performed miracles before. He has done amazing things, 
and he knew that he could come back to life. And Jesus said that he would see everyone again soon. So they put him into the tomb, which was like a big cave. And then they put some things on him. They put some little cloth, some linen cloth, and they covered him up. And they put some spices over him, probably so he wouldn't smell. And they, they got a giant, giant rock, and they pushed it in front of the tomb. Jesus was stuck in there. It was stuck. Three days later, the earth shook. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and pushed the stone away. So an angel came down and pushed the stone away. And when the soldiers saw the angel, they fell to the ground. They were so surprised to actually see a real angel. Jesus' friend Mary was walking to the tomb and saw the angel, who said, Do not be afraid. Jesus is not here. He has risen. So when they opened the tomb, when they looked in there, Jesus wasn't even in there. So then they found this one, the most important egg of all. And did you take it, did you take it out of here? I didn't take anything out of there. There was nothing in here? No, it didn't come oh. with anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. this one's the empty tomb. This is the exciting one because this shows us that there's nothing in here because Jesus has already risen. He's alive and he is well and he has come back to life to forgive us for our sins. And that is the story of Easter and why Easter is so important. Now, I know that what you're really here for are these Easter eggs, though. So I'd love it if you would now listen to Miss Emily, me, I'm standing right there, listen to her and see what she has to say about what you're going to do next. Have fun on your Easter egg hunt, and I will see you guys all soon. So obviously, sorry, we're not having another Easter egg hunt. But thank you for listening to the video. I think that it's a great way to teach our kids about what Palm Sunday is and about Easter in a way that is more manageable for them to understand. And if you were here now, you heard the whole Easter story, and you don't need to come to church next week. That's not true. That's not true. That is not true. Thank you all so much.